sleep this morning for us. We thank you, God, for all the many blessings you bestowed upon the, us. And God, even in the midst of a pandemic, we know that you rule and super rule. And we know, God, that we are all in your hands. And we know that this is working out for our good. And so we trust and believe you. And God, that you're going to take us through this. And God, even when we're in this, yes. we ask you, God, that we would learn and draw closer to you, that we would hear your voice and understand your word better. Teach us, God, not to murmur and complain, but teach us, God, in all things to give thanks, for we know that this is your will. So as we study your word, God, we ask you that we would rightly divide the word of truth, have no private interpretation of your word, and most importantly, God, when we hear your word, we would apply it to our lives. And God, when you've done these things, we'll be so careful to give your name glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll start our Sabbath school. We are men. Yes, the Amen. Amen, Saints. And so, um, 
for those that are in the church and those that are listening and looking at us on Facebook, uh, we're going to go through like we do, um, go through our lesson. We're not going to get to all the scriptures today, uh, but we're going to spend a considerable amount of time uh, just going through some of the scriptures in the book of John. And if you've got your Bible with you, I'm going to ask you just to follow along as we dig into these scriptures. Um, I'm a big believer in just taking time to read God's Word so we can hear the voice of God because I do believe that the Word of God is God. And so whenever we actually read His Word, we're getting to hear directly from Him. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, what I will do, I'll go through it. We'll read some of the key scriptures. We'll pause for questions. As you know, Apostle and I typically will go back and forth as, as we interact with one another. But let's just jump into the Sabbath School lesson, into our introduction. The Bible is a collection of writings that is considered the role of standard for Christians. It consists of two testaments, 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, and over 7, 788,000 words. The writings were by over 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years. The authors consisted of kings, farmers, fishermen, a tent maker, homeless prophet, a doctor, a personal scribe, vocational musicians, pastors, etc. These writings were done on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In addition, it was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. With all of these factors to play, scholars and theologians are amazed at the continuity of this book. The writings are cohesive and fit together perfectly. One of the most popular reasons the Bible is studied is for its historical content. But it contains more than historical literature. It also consists of law, poetry, prophecy, genealogy, and narrative. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the Bible is the best-selling book of all time with an estimated 5 billion copies sold and distributed. With so many Bibles in circulation, it can be easy for us as believers to take this book for granted. But we as believers should feel obligated to learn the content of the Bible. It's a memory verse. Let's meet our, read our memory verse together. It's Psalms 119.89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Biblical application. With the popularity of the Bible and how widespread it is, we as believers are, are to be mindful of the fact that the Bible is no ordinary book. But we learn through the scriptures themselves that the Bible is the word of God. We also learn that, the, that God is his word and that every jot and every tittle is important. His word is necessary for our development, for our growth. God's word is everlasting. It gives us instruction for every aspect of our lives. It shows us God's likes and his dislikes. It reveals blessings and curses, right and wrong, holy and unholy. It even reveals the state of mankind and the society around us. We are privileged to have God's word today because of martyrs like William Tyndale, who wanted to make sure the common man could have and read the sacred writings for themselves. Let us explore the scriptures about God's word. So I'm going to stop right there. Apostle, is there anything you want to comment as we went through that first part, as we read this, as we jump into this lesson today? Uh, good morning, uh, Superintendent and Teacher, Deacon Preston, Sister Charmaine, and um, those that are here in the sanctuary, just have a few here, and those that are sharing with us by either by way of Facebook uh, Live or by um, conference call, we thank you for taking the time to be with us. I also want to say I get comments from time to time throughout the week as for some people to let me know how much they are enjoying the Sabbath school lessons. I'm talking about people who are not actually, you know, members here, but sharing with us. And we thank you for choosing us as the um, the, the lesson that you, you're listening to this morning. This lesson today is talking about the Word of God. And so there's so much out there about people questioning, is it real? Is it true? Is it a fairy tale? And all of these things. And I think this lesson today would help answer some of those questions. Um, one of the things that concerns me is that so many versions of the Bible is right. being um, penned today. And, and my caution is, yes, we use the King James version of the Bible as a standard reference, and, but we also recognize that there are some other translations that uh, serve as well. And, but we've got to be careful. 
some translations actually take very perfect words right. and twist them or give them a, another meaning that it actually distorts what the text is really saying. That's right. So as you read, you always have to be very, very careful that you not um, allow the version that you're reading take away the truth of God's word, because that was never God's intent. He's, you found that in that lesson today, the word was written by holy and inspired men, That's right. uh, that, that, that God controlled that. Amen. So as we jump into the lesson today, what I would have you think about is this. If this is God's word, wouldn't you want to know what God's saying about you now? Yeah. Right? So if this is God's word. It's an inspired book. Um, God has inspired men to write this, and he writes things about you. He writes things about me. And so there's some things as we jump into God's word. Uh, I remember our elect lady Solomon. She had this thing for Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth. Yeah. And she would share that. And so the amazing thing to me is if you've got the instructions, What's the need of having the instructions if we don't follow them? That's true. Right? So if you've got the instructions and we don't follow them, then guess what? We're going to be actually led astray. So what I want to do first, let's jump into one of our first scriptures. And I'm going to spend some time in the book of John. Um, and I think it's really important. So actually the first scripture we're going to go to is not in the Sabbath school lesson, but we're going to actually jump into John chapter 20. John chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 30 and 31. Then we're going to go over to John chapter 1, which is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and we, we quote that one a lot. But I want to spend time in the book of John, and I want to just get into the Word. All right, so when you have that, let's say amen. 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 So I want us to think about this. I did this last week, so y'all know the Apostle Peter is one of my favorite disciples. And then there's John. So I want to talk about who John is. There's some important uh, facts I think you should know about John as we actually dig into this writing. So when you think about John, John, just like Peter, is an eyewitness. He's an ear witness. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. He, along with his brother James, are in the inner circle with Jesus. So it was Peter, James, and John. Those three disciples actually saw things that the other disciples were not privy to. Uh, for example, Peter and John, when Jesus said, go prepare for the Passover, he sent Peter and John. Uh, the other thing, some say that John was the disciple that Jesus loved. And they reference John as that beloved disciple. Uh, when Jesus was dying on the cross, I think this is so important. If you took the time, and I'll just have you make a note, if you go to John 19, 26 and 27, when Jesus is dying on the cross, he was one of the few disciples that was actually there by witnessing Jesus' final suffering. And Jesus says to John, John, take care of my mom. That's so important. So think about this. John is watching Jesus die. As Jesus is taking his last breaths, he looks at John and says, John, take care of my mom. Because you know he was coming back not in a human form. That's right. That was his, That's right. his mother. That was his mom. His natural mom. But when he, after the crucifixion, he's going to come back. That's right. But then he come back in different forms. In a very different form. I love that point. And so Jesus trusts John enough to say, hey, this is now your mom. Yeah. And the scripture says from that point forward, she lived in John's house. Yeah. So I think that's important. The other thing is, as you think about John, John is the writer of the book of John, the book of Revelations, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we get to hear from John as we jump into the scripture. So I'm going to have you just look at um, John chapter 20, verse But not John the Baptist. But he's not John the Baptist. That's a good point. John the Baptist is off the scene at this point. Yes. Uh, as you know, he was beheaded. And so this is not John the Baptist. This is John um, the Revelator. This, John the Revelator. <laughs> uh, the sons of uh, Zebedee. And they are fishermen. Right. So this is this John. So John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And so as we dig into the lesson today, the reason we study the word of God is that we would know Jesus Christ, 
that we believe that he is the son of God, and at the end of the day, that we have life through his name. Amen? So, so let's jump to John chapter 1. And this is a very familiar passage of scripture that we're going to spend some time on. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. While you're doing that, thanks be careful and be mindful of the mutual phones. I hear a little movement in the background. It may be just uh, uncomfortable for the other students. All right, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and we're actually going to read down to verse 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, Apostle, as you hear that, and we think about this thing, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What comes to your mind as we look at this lesson God, about God's Word? I think the important thing as it relates, and we use the scripture a lot for different, for different lessons and for different purposes, but for our lesson today, simply saying, we talk about the word of God, where the word was in the beginning, and the word was right there, um, because we know the word is God, mm -hmm. we also know Jesus is God, but for our lesson today is emphasizing the word is, was in the beginning with God. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we think about this, so if I'm listening to our Sabbath school lesson today, are you saying to me, Apostle Ragman, that this Bible right here that I'm holding in my hand is actually God? It's God. And, and understand, it was revealed. See, now in the beginning, Genesis to Revelation was not there. That's right. Okay, understand That's that. Right. All we had in the beginning was that, that particular day mm -hmm. that it was talking about, but what it's saying is that God knows everything. Mm -hmm. we, we're in the midst of this virus, God knows the outcome of it. That's right. He knows how many lives are going to be lost. Mm -hmm. He knows the impact that is going to have on different people's lives. He knows how it's going to affect churches, and God knows all of that. So in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was allowed to be manifested day by day by day but it all was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. He said he knows the end mm -hmm. from, the from the beginning. He already knew it. Right. So um, what we're reading now, and, and, and this particular writing, if you would, uh, even the person of John, right. John was not in the beginning, right. but the knowledge of John mm -hmm. was in the beginning with God. I, I like that point, because I was studying for this lesson, I thought it was interesting that John begins with in the beginning, and that's how Genesis begins. Right. Genesis begins with in the beginning, when there was actually nothing in the earth. He says in the beginning, that all of a sudden God comes on, he's, he speaks, and things begin to happen. Everything is contained in God. Mm. Everything. My, my, my beginning, my ending, uh, each one of us, the whole world, this, this world is subject to God and what God allows. Okay. He doesn't ordain in the sense of approving everything, mm -hmm. but if that's the case, we would have a perfect world. That's right. But he allows the world to unfold, our lives to unfold. He gives permission because he knows the mind of man. He knows what we're going to do. He knows the scripture where he knows our thoughts, our thoughts. are far off. He knows this time next week what my thoughts are going to be. And no matter what I think about it, no matter how I think it's going to play out, he already knows. Amen. And that's the awesomeness of God. We're talking about 2,000 years, um, uh, 4,000 years ago, all this was knowledge. Every, every minute, every jot, mm -hmm. or every tittle. Right. I always thought those two words were um, it's like separate, mm -hmm. but in my research, I find they are used right. together. It's just simply saying, a very something that's very very tiny, mm -hmm. extremely small job and temple. Yeah. And so I think the other thing is we look at this verse. He says in verse three, he said, "All things were made by him, right? Mm -hmm. And without him was not anything, anything made, anything that was made, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we think about that for us, is that he said all things were made by him. Mm -hmm. 
So all of us were made by him, the sun, the moon, the stars. And so if you jump back to Genesis, when, when he actually says, let there be, it happens. Yeah. And the other thing I would have us think about is when, when we think about God's word, and that's why I get excited to study God's word, is God's word speaking directly to us. How many of you have had an experience that you're, you're asking God to speak to you and you pick up the Bible? And he leads you to something that says, my goodness, this is actually what I needed at this moment. This is actually what I needed to hear. There are times where I, I, I can't get the answer and I just pick up God's word. Yeah. And guess what? God's word actually speaks to my heart and meets my need. Even though it was written way many, many years, centuries before you were born, mm -hmm. the word of God is, because the scripture said the word of God is quick. That's right. I mean, it's alive. It, it, even though it was written some years ago, it's still alive today. And what you were saying, it addressed our life situations today. Well, that's a good segue into our next scripture, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to go right to that one because exactly what you said in that piece. So we'll jump to the um, scripture in Hebrews. And again, this is a very familiar passage of scripture. But I think we just want to make sure we get a good understanding of it. So Hebrews chapter 12, or chapter 4. And we're going to go to verse 12. And then after that, we'll actually pause for any questions. So Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12, and this is how it reads. For the word of God is quick, or like you said, apostle, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. So as I listen to that, I know the word of God is alive, but when I study God's word, there's some other benefits I get from studying God's word. Would you agree with that? Yes, but I'm gonna ask you this question. Yeah. In, in, in the scripture here, yeah. where does soul and spirit divides? Mm. I'm gonna have to let you answer that one. No, no, you, you, you tell it to me. Yeah. <laughs> but where does it divide? Where is the divide? That you can't I don't know. Exactly. And I can't tell that. The only what? Only the word. Mm. Duh, duh, duh. That. That's so, so important for us. Yeah. Only the word can divide soul and spirit. Yeah. Yet when, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he became a living soul. A living soul. That's right. And the spirit came with the breath. Mm. But there is a fine line that divides the two that we can identify. I love that insight because he, here's the thing, that if I know God's word, and right here, things that I may not be able to explain or know, right. God's word can do that. that way knows. God's word can clarify. God's word can Simple actually do things. Things. That's right. Yeah. I love that point. So as we think about this point, Apostle, and I want us to think about it, then we're going to open up for questions. He says that his word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents. Is that of my heart or someone else's heart? The heart. The heart. Man's heart. Okay. Yeah. So it's a discerning the thoughts uh, yeah, of, of each of us. Heart. Of each of us. Okay. I mean, we can present whatever we want to the public. We can have people thinking that we, we are right there in a certain place. You remember those people over your lifetime? People have said things that it's just done you because you didn't think mm -hmm. they thought that way. You didn't think they felt that way. And they opened their mouth and they, you like almost stepped back and what are you saying? I don't believe it. I can't believe that that's part of your character. Mm -hmm. But guess what? God knew it from the, from the first day you met him. Through the word. <laughs> that's right. That's a good point. I want to stop here. I want to open it up for questions. Before we get to the question that, um, and I'm going to, uh, turn the volume up on the polycon, but I did hear a little, I don't hear it now, so please make sure, unless you're asking the question, that you keep your phone muted. Sister Rhonda um, is working the camera, and I think there is a question? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you have the question, okay. Okay. All right, so, when we think about the Bible, hopefully everybody can hear me. When we think about the Bible, Okay, so on my little device, I have about 53 plus Bibles on my device. And we constantly hear commentaries of all different 
degrees, all difference of, of opinion. So how do I know whether what I'm reading is what Jesus really is saying? Okay, good question, good question. Okay. That's a great question. Um, do you want to take that? Because I've, I've got a view that... Um, okay, this, what, this kind of what I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, that was a Christian bookstore nationally that went out of business recently. So I went to Richmond to um, to get see what they that I would want. They had a book, uh, about that thick, about an inch or so thick, for each book in the Bible. See what I'm saying now? If I stack all of those up together, I've got six or some inches of, of, of commentary. So I have to recognize the commentary, and, and no matter how it looks at Matthew Henry and, and others, they are good um, commentary. They give good commentary, but you cannot accept everything mm -hmm. that they say. Uh, it's uh, it, what, what the word saying, and whether I, I was saying a moment ago, you said 53 different versions of the, of the Bible. It takes the Spirit of God to give the right revelation mm -hmm. to each of those. See what I'm saying? Um, it may sound good, it may be um, a, a theory that you could embrace. Even though it's maybe a theory that you could embrace, the truth is, is that what God intended for the word to say? And the only way you're going to know that is really be empowered with the Spirit of God. You still might not understand what the answer is, but the Spirit of God will let you know that that's not it. Yeah, so here's the thing I would say for us as believers, <clears throat> because I think when you, when you get into the conversation, especially around the Bible, and if, if you are with people who study the Bible a lot, they will find some things that could be apparent contradictions. Right. The cornerstone of our faith is not the Bible. The cornerstone of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. And so here's the thing I would say. If I don't, if, if nothing, if I don't believe anything else, right. if the resurrection is true, yes. if he said, I'm going to die and in three days I'm going to get up, Guess what? I don't really care about anything else. And so the reason I, I'm, I focus on the resurrection right. is that the resurrection we know, and I was, doing, I was studying this with my family last night, we know not only in the Bible, but there are extra biblical texts that say Jesus was real. Yes. There are extra biblical texts. If you look at Josephus, if you look at Plinius, if you look at Tacitus, these are actually historians. They said Jesus was a real person. Right. Jesus is actually written about in other, uh, in other books outside of the Bible. Six, six, right. And the thing is, what I would say is when we look at the scripture, if I can believe that the resurrection is true, it's settled. Even the best atheist will say, if you prove the resurrection, I no longer have an argument. That's why the power of God's word is so true. Because what Jesus said, he said, I'm going to die. But guess what? I'm going to get up. Right. He said, I'm going to lay down my life, and guess what? I will pick it up again. So if I can believe, said, no man had the power to no do man it. had the power to take it. But the reality is, if I can believe in the resurrection, I can trust everything else that he says. And that to me, Apostle, that's where believers have to get to is, you know what? I believe the resurrection. Here's the other thing, and then we'll open up for questions. I believe the disciples didn't believe. They were with him three and a half years. But when Jesus was crucified, they were all hiding. It wasn't like that they were bold and they were out preaching once he died. Like, you know what? He's going to come back. They were all hiding in a room, scared to death. It wasn't until Jesus came back and said, Thomas, you don't believe because you didn't see it. But here, put your hand, put your hand in, in the nail prints. Put your hands in the side. And Thomas was like, now I believe. And then Jesus says, I'm going to bless all those who don't have the opportunity to see what you're seeing. They're still going to believe. Apostles. Because if they really believed, right. they would have been somewhere near the tomb right. on the third day. <laughs> That's, That's a good point. That's a if great they point. really believed, it, they would have been near the tomb That's right. because they would have anticipated his resurrection. Right. Mary and Martha and the other, they did not go there expecting to find the risen Savior. They went there out of respect mm -hmm. 
to make sure that his body decayed with honor. That's right. That's what they did. That's right. And when they got there, they found they now when the angels told them, they believed then. Mm -hmm. But and they went and told the others, and they really didn't accept it. And like you said, until they got to the and, and then when they were walking on the road when Jesus appeared to them, That's right. he talked to them a long time. And at the end of his conversation, he made himself known to them and then disappeared. That's right. So, I, I, again, I just think as believers, if I can believe in the resurrection, so that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, you know, if, I, if the resurrection is, isn't true, then my preaching's in vain. Okay. But he also says, listen, he was seen of the disciples. He was seen of the apostles. He was seen of around 500 people. And as Paul was writing the book of Corinthians, he said, and some of those people are actually still alive. So I want to open it up for questions because uh, I, I love talking about the resurrection. Okay. Any questions? Especially those that now, if you are on Facebook Live and you have a question, yeah. just show it and Sister Rhonda will give it to us. Yep. Um, but if you are on um, um, conference call, go ahead and state your question or comments. It may not be a question. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got a question. This is Penny Williams from North Virginia. Yes, it's Penny. I have two questions. Uh -huh. Okay, the first one is, um, in the beginning it was the Word and the Word was God. So my question is, uh, if the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, were they there also, the Son and the Holy Spirit there with God in the beginning? And I'm going to answer with a very easy um, one word, yes. Uh, Deacon Preston was reading um, in St. John chapter 1, and he read verses 1 through 5. If you would pick up at verse 14, mm -hmm. you will see that, the, that Jesus was in the beginning, because it said, in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, right? That's 1 and 1. 1 and 14 says what? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, it was Jesus in the beginning. Because the Word was in the beginning. The Word was made flesh um, in the New Testament. That was, that was all, and when all of this was actually brought, when Jesus was brought um, into what we know as a man form. But he was God in, in the beginning. That's right. Good question. Sister, you had two questions. What was the other one? The second question is, uh, what does it mean when it says that Jesus was slain before the foundations of the earth? <coughs> Yeah, so when, when Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth, with all things, um, my interpretation of that scripture is that uh, we knew all things that were going to happen. So this event, so Jesus was actually the sacrifice for sin from the very beginning. So God knew that when Adam and Eve were created, that they were going to fall out of the plan of salvation, that they were going to sin. But he had already created the sacrifice of Jesus and that's why he was slain from the foundation of the world. That act was already done. It was manifested um, at, at Calvary, but it was already a part of God's plan that he would be slain from the foundations of the world. And let me add to you, right? Let me add to that that um, everything that we know of today played out in heaven That's right. before earth was created. Mm -hmm. Everything that we know. And everything that, um, that, that, if you start to read the book of Revelation, it talked about the um, devil was wrought with the woman and, uh, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And, and that, that played out in heaven before it even hit the earth. I think your question is a good question from the standpoint of, and, and I want to expand on that a little bit because everything that happened in earth was actually, as you said, happened in heaven, but it was even the tabernacle that was, was made on the earth was actually a replica of what's already in heaven. Because they said in Revelation, I think 19, the heaven was open, and what did they see? They saw the tabernacle. They saw the tabernacle. Yeah. But I, I love that. That's a great question. Any other questions? Yes, Brother Bob. Yes, Brother Bob. I was wondering about the word of God as, as, as people was, was, was being taught the word of God back in the slavery days that the people that the preachers they went around with the uh, slave masters 
teaches the, the, the uh, field workers um, the word of God, but when, when they were teaching them in front of the slave masters, they taught it in a different way of, to, to benefit the slave masters, but when they got behind closed doors in, in, in their own privacy, they had a, had a more deeper interpretation for the, for, for the slave souls. But do you think that that's what confuses a lot of people over the years that uh, preaches the word there, that, that they preach sometimes for their own benefit and they, they misinterpret the God's word and that they are teaching the congregation? Well, you, uh, well, well, I would say this. One of the things that you, you have addressed is the um, uh, during the days of slavery, um, people, the slave owners, they used scriptures that told people um, to serve the master. And, and, and like you said, that was for their benefit. But nothing has changed. People still use the word of God to... Um, benefit themselves. So whether it's, whether it's slave and slave masters or whatever it is, people pull excerpts out of the Word of God that was going to... Um, let me read Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. This is kind of what you were talking about. It says, Servants be obedient to them that are your masters mm -hmm. according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the singleness of your hearts as unto Christ. So you talk what you're talking about, uh, people take the word. Uh, but at the top of this writing, in, in the book of Eph uh, Ephesians, the thing is, there were um, saints that, that had slaves. Oh, slaves. That's right. And the term slave and, and has treated uh, actually made me a little different in, um, in here in the book of Ephesians than what took place some 400 plus years ago in this country or even 200 years ago. So the whole concept of slave and master, um, yes, it can be used to justify slavery, just if you take it just that little bit out of the scripture, but not get full understanding. Well, I think, his, I think his question is a good one from the standpoint of, I think it begs the question for us that we have to study God's word. Right. And we have to be under ministries that are going to study God's word and rightly divide the word of truth. So when we think about how things get passed on from, as I've shared before, from grandparents and great grandparents, sometimes we take what people have taught us and we perceive it as the gospel and the word of God. But if I never take the time to actually study, then what happens is I can actually be led astray. And that's why in this dispensation, God has given us the Bible. He's given us good teachers. The thing I would say for all of us is that there will be things I think that can come up in the scriptures that will challenge what I have been taught. Exactly. Rather than picking up the Bible and looking at the Bible to justify what I do, I have to look at the Bible and say, God, what is your word saying that I need to be doing and then when he when he says that, the thing is, I've got to be willing to obey that. And you know, Dick and Preston, that's where so many people are today. That's right. So many good Christian people, I put it that way, are today where that they have been taught by good people that they knew loved the Lord. That's right. They would watch these people on the hot, sunny, when, I mean, uh, summer afternoon, sitting on the porch, no air conditioning. Um, reading God's word in, in the heat of the day. These were good people. Good people. And you knew whatever they told you, you felt to be true. You, you thought that to be true according to, uh, if, if they believed it, it must have been true. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna steer me wrong. Not only did they believe it, they did it themselves. That's right. But when you start getting into God's word, then you're going to have to understand that what grandma taught me may not be true. That's right. And once, once my eyes come open, now I'm in an awkward situation because when I didn't know, I felt okay. Mm -hmm. I felt like I'm sister Charmaine, daughter had an experience, I won't go into it, that somebody didn't know something and they were preparing to, to give a message. Mm -hmm. And then every time they would, would try to give the message, the truth that they had learned just a few days before that was bombarding them, but how can I teach 
How can I preach what I normally would preach about this event when now I have different insight? That's right. The truth, everybody wants the truth, but they don't want to act, they don't necessarily want to do it once they find out, because it may contradict so much that they've been exposed to. Yeah, and I, th I think when I look at it, that's why I love John 17 and 17 when he has said, he says, sanctify them through thy truth, yeah, thy right. word is truth. That's right. And so the word is truth, and, and that's why I really believe to have Bible-based teaching to people who are searching the scriptures to make sure that the messages that are given are truth. That's really important. So I always encourage people, whether it's this ministry or, or another ministry, you've got to find someone who is going to be willing to open up your understanding of God's word, to study God's word and really understand what thus said the Lord. You know, this is a milestone year for us. Without the virus and a few, less than a month, but a month time, we would have been celebrating our centennial, which we'll do next year if the Lord permit. But what I think about with this ministry, this ministry started in 1920. Mm -hmm. My great grandfather was the founder. But when I think about what he gave mm -hmm. to this ministry and where this ministry has evolved in a hundred years, there were things that he didn't do. There were things that he didn't know. There was, but he gave, when he started the church, it, everything he knew. That's right. It might have been in contradiction to other ministries. But he said, this I know is true. Right. But over the years, it had been built upon, mm -hmm. and built upon, and built upon. In a hundred years, it has brought us to this place. If we had taken what um, Elder Charles Lewis said in 1920 and never grew from it, <laughs> think about it. That's right. That's we would be jumping and shouting, yeah. speaking in tongues, because those are the things that he knew was right. He knew that was right. He knew that was right. But the other things that has come through revelation over the years has brought us to this place. And I'm not picking on ministries, but a lot of ministries where they were 100 years ago, the philosophies um, and the understanding has not changed in 100 years. This is the way we've done it. Just the way we've always done it. And if you're going to be a member here, this way you're going to continue to do it. Amen. And that's a sad philosophy. That's right. It's a poor commentary when you think about how God want us to continue to study and learn his word. And like you said earlier, once you learn it, do it. Do it. That's right. Good point. Good conversation. Any questions from our audience here? If... If not, I want to jump into, it's not in the lesson, but um, Ephesians chapter 6. You were in Ephesians, mm -hmm. um, but I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6 because I think this is really important as we think about um, the word and the weapons that we have to fight the enemy because in Ephesians chapter 6, we know that this is the whole armor of God conversation as we think about God's armor and everything that's going on. So Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and I think this is important as we think about God's Word and why is it so important to study God's Word. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so when I think about that, all the other weapons in the armor of God are really protective weapons, defensive weapons, but the Word of God is actually my offensive weapon. It's the thing that if I've got God's Word, so when I encounter things that may be sin, when I've got God's Word, if I know God's Word, it will bring something to my attention to say, that's not right. Uh, if I'm in a situation and I'm confused, it's God's Word that will help direct me. The book of James says that I need wisdom. All I got to do is ask for wisdom and God will give it to me. It's the thing that I think when we study God's Word, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, he would say, it is written because it's the word of God. And never Satan said it was written, but Jesus countered um, response to him, but, but it's written again. Again, that's right. See, people tell you the Bible said, the Bible said, but you got to study God's word to that's let them understand that, but it's written again. That's right. Great point. Great point. And, and, yeah. that, and that's the reason why, and that's the reason why the scripture says, let all men be lions. But My word be true. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know. And I love, I love, I love that point because that's word, right? So if all men are liars, all I need to make sure is true is what? God's word. Let me touch on that. 
that, that scripture, okay. let all men be liars, in my word be true. See, the thing is, we use the term liar, and the scripture does also, in many cases, as um, something derogatory. Mm -hmm. Here, in this particular scripture, it said, let all men be unlearned or not knowing. It's still, lie, it's still a lie. But it's not always the beaten up liar. Right. It's not always the liar that know better and just blatantly telling lies. But people are told lies. There are, there are many, oh goodness, <laughs> there are many lies in the pulpit. Mm. Right? Mm. But many of those liars in the pulpit do not know truth. Think about it. Let all men be liars. Let preachers be liars for what they are saying. Not liars by character, not liars by their blatant disregard of God's word, but even if they tell a lie, and I can think of a few right now that's told often, but that's, they are liars when it comes to that, that passage of scripture, but it's my word that's going to stand as a defense against that lie they told. But, the, but you, what I hear you saying is, their intention is not to lie. Not to lie. They don't have a malicious intent to lie. What's happening is they're just teaching what they may have been taught. Exactly. Or they have their own interpretation of what's been taught. But it's God's word that is going to be true. See, there's a liar that um, that that God is against. He's against all lies. Mm -hmm. And there's a liar that will have his part in the lake, in the lake because he knows that he is lying. That's right. You know, you ask him, he tell you uh, just late to tell you a lie, right? That's right. But then there is a liar that does not know he's lying. Wow, okay. And see, and if you work with that liar, the word, he's let my word be true, that true word can take him from being a liar to being a true representative of God's word. But I gotta have the desire to want to learn truth. I, want, I have to have the desire as a person who wants to learn right. truth right. and God's word that when I hear the truth, that even though it's different than what I may know, that I have a de desire to say, but it's in God's word. In my years, likewise all of us, over the years, we have lied. Mm -hmm. That's right. Think about That's it. That's right. We have lied with good intent. That's right. When it comes to God's word. But the question is, when God enlightened us and we came to the truth, did we allow the word not only to be true, but to be true in us, and we change that position. Mm, good point. And, and that goes back to, you know, when you see, when you hear the truth, you, know, you see the light, you walk therein. Mm -hmm. And the word, the light, the word is also a light to our path, mm -hmm. right. halfway of darkness. Right. And, you know, and even when we have the word of caution, you know, for we were mentioning about those that have the, the, the Holy Red, yeah, and, they're sh and they're sharing, they're sharing the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You know, they can lead. It says the blind would lead the blind into a ditch. Yeah, they go find Unfortunately, but if they come to and if they're open up, open to receive God's Word and not hold on to the traditions of man, because that's the problem that when you were, you were mentioning about when ministries or people hold on to. Um, the traditions and not willing to change. If we did something a hundred years ago, and we and a hundred years later, fast forward, we're still doing, doing the same thing. thing. You know, because life is about evolution and evolving. For when I, I've been in the ministry in this congregation now over thirty years, what you know, what I experience. So if you can hold the mic a little closer. What I experience. Um, for being taught here has changed, has evolved. Mm -hmm. Because you said when you know the, the uh, past apostle Raglan, when the, he had uh, God gave him revelation, he changed his stance on how even when we're um, not holding on to the commandments, but we're, we're preaching Jesus, mm -hmm. because Jesus is the key. Right. And then we, as we mentioned, He is also the Word. That's right. Yeah, I think the other, and I, I want to just touch on that point because I think it's important when we when we think about what um, Deacon Allen said. Traditions are dangerous no, when you think about the Word of God, because the reality is when you think about it, Jesus even told the scribes and the Pharisees 
is that you would keep your traditions rather than keeping the commandments of God. Right. Because they had, they had, because think about this, traditions are good for the most part, but when a tradition is so entrenched and becomes doctrine, that's when it can become very dangerous. That's why it's so important to have God's word to say, wait a minute, when I hold the word of God up, it's the light. That's what John said in John chapter one. It's the thing that will uncover darkness. And sometimes we just gotta be mindful that traditions can actually hinder the church from moving forward. How does the element of faith plays in, in, in God's word? I know, you know, without faith it's impossible to please him. Right. I, I get that. But how does faith really um, in work help us to um, believe or understand or receive from God? Yes, my, and I love that question. So when we think about faith, and this is the thing, so I bring up John and Peter's eye and ear witnesses. Mm -hmm. I did not see, I did not hear Jesus preach or teach. Okay. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't see any of those things. But as I open up my understanding and think about our own church experience, when I get to the point, because I believe God will draw us my, this, my confession of faith is, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And I accept that, not having any proof of it. I don't have, I can say it's the Bible, but if I, if I didn't even have the Bible, if I didn't have any written text, I would still believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And what faith does, faith, if I have faith, faith draws me closer to God. And that's why I think, and I love the question, faith is so important because it says without faith it's impossible to please him. But all I need is a little faith. All I need is a little bit of faith to say, you know what? And I tell people this all the time. If you don't believe in Jesus, all you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. If I don't believe in Jesus, if you're listening to the broadcast or you're watching on Facebook Live and you don't even believe in Jesus, all you got to do is say, Jesus if you are real, come into my life. And I promise you, I promise you, he will. That's the type of God that we serve. That's the type of God we serve. Is that if I need an encounter with the personal Jesus. Because here's the thing we got to understand. My relationship with Jesus is personal. It isn't based on the church. It's based on me knowing Jesus. And so when I have faith in him, and all I need is a little bit, that's why the scripture says you need to faith the size of what? A mustard seed. And that faith will grow. All I got to do is call out to Jesus, and I promise he will answer. Apostle, I'm going to get excited. Hey, I know, kid, 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 got some stuff. I just want to say this real quick. Understand this. God spared Moses when he was supposed to be killed. Moses lived in, the, in Pharaoh's house. Moses did all of this. 75 years later, Moses had a personal encounter Come on. with God. And when Moses had a personal encounter with God, everything about Moses' life changed after that. Uh, I'm going to say one thing. We're going to let Brother Kenny go. <laughs> and and that's, that's the point. That's the point. When you have a personal encounter with Jesus, you're going to change. You, change. You, you may not, you're not going to necessarily become perfected or perfect, but when you encounter Jesus, yes. there's nobody in the word of God that ran into Jesus that was not changed. Mm -hmm. When I think about Zacchaeus, when he was running up to the sycamore tree, Jesus said, man, you got to come to my house. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Is that when you think about when you have a personal encounter with Jesus, yes. you will be changed. I'm not just saying a dalliance where you just want to run in and run out. Because you can have those type of just connection calls with Jesus. But what I'm saying, when you want to be intimate with him, when you want to spend time with him, that's why the word is so important. And I just want to say, when you think about how many times did you went to study God's word and you got sleepy? <laughs> How many times have you went to study God's word and there was something, you, you just lost your energy? But we, I tell my children, show me your screen time. <laughs> you show me your screen time and then just give, give God 10 minutes. I gave him a 10 minute challenge. Just give God 10 minutes because guess what? He don't need five hours, but I guarantee you, if you give him 10 minutes, he'll speak to you. He'll speak to your heart. He'll change your, come on somebody. He'll do these things for you. But guess what? If I draw nigh to him, guess what's going to happen? He's going to come on. 
Brother Ken. Brother Ken. And that brings me back to he said, faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Yeah. And you know, and, and even before you might may have read the scriptures, somebody said something to you about the, the man called Jesus. That's right. That's and right. that right there, that was the beginning of one's faith, that I had to believe who he is. Right. And that in one, he could forgive me for my sins, but most of all, I can develop a relationship and I can have receive eternal life and to come out of whatever lifestyle that I'm in. Man, so I always say this, when I think about Jesus and the things that Jesus has delivered me from, I, I think for all of us as believers, and this is why this, this lesson is so important, the Word of God gives me exposure to the things that God wants me to do and doesn't want me to do. I looked at something earlier this morning by Pastor Tony Evans, and he said, God will not compete for my commitment. No. And I thought that was powerful from the standpoint of when you think about the scripture, one of the sins that really aggravated God was idolatry. So you, he was like, you can't have another God before me. And so the reality in the world we live in today, and all of us have to be mindful of, what is the God that I put before the true God? Because when I'm in a committed relationship, guess what that means? The committed relationship means he's the one and only. He's the supreme one. And so when I get up in the morning, who's the first person I want to see? That's right. That's right. I want to spend time with him. I want, I want to enjoy my cup of coffee with God. I want, to cut, I want to get my coffee. I want to go into my office. I want to sit down and hear his voice because guess what? I'm in a committed relationship. And when I sit down and study his word, I don't, I'm going to be honest with you. There are times I study the word and guess what? I get up and I'm like, man, <laughs> I ain't hear nothing. I read it. I didn't get anything from it. But there are also times where I sit down and it is sweet where God says, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I've talked to you when you actually felt like you didn't get anything. I was still getting something. But there are other times where God in his word, when I spend time with him, that he will actually speak to me. And it sets the tone for my day. And, and I interact with people. My whole spirit could be different because I spent time with him First, yes. last thing, and I'll give it to Apostle. When you watch Jesus' behavior, here is the Son of God that actually came down from heaven, enveloped himself in flesh, stepped out of his own glory to come down to save man. Good God. He did all those things, but guess what he did? In the morning, guess what he would do? He would steal away to pray. That's right. He spent time with the Father because he said, guess what? That's the most important relationship I should have. I got to talk to Dad. I got to have interaction. I got to stay connected because I'm committed to the mission that he's put me on, that's where we need to be as the children of God. Apostle, I'm going to shut my mouth. No, you're fine. You know, in, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we emphasize verse 1 and we emphasize verse 6. And all of this good, as we should. But when I was reading verse 3, through faith, somebody asked about the question about faith in the word. Okay. It says, through faith, we understand that the worlds, and I, talk, I ain't talking about that today, the worlds were framed by what? The Word of God. The Word of God. But we don't get how the world is made uh, by the Word of God unless it's through faith. Yes. Yeah? So that the things were which were which are seen are not made of things which do appear. Yes. See, but you don't get that. This 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 eleventh chapter of Hebrews called the honor roll of faith because right. it takes you through through different individuals yeah. that they did what they did because of faith. Mm -hmm. Faith would not say to a ninety year old barren woman that you're gonna have a child. You know, without that, you can't be here, right? Because she laughed. Yeah. That's right. That's she laughed. Right. But faith said, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna do this thing, yes. and you're gonna see it." Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, one one example after another after another, and it shows that faith in God will yield miraculous results. Mm. Yes. I love that as you were talking about that faith example. I was I was studying that, and in that same scripture it says, "Is there anything too hard, too hard for God? Nothing. Nothing's Nothing. too hard for God. Except to believe. I gotta believe. just believe. I gotta believe. All right, I'm getting excited, so let's go to uh, Psalms 119." 
11 through 16, and this is actually familiar. So we've got two more scriptures we want to get through. We want to get through Psalms 119, 11 through 16, and then we really want to finish it up with Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, uh, because I want to make sure we understand when God says something's going to happen, guess what? It's going to happen. So I just got to have confidence in God's word. So Psalms 119. And um, you will notice that some of this is actually in our Sabbath school book, right? It is. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, Psalms 119. I'm actually going to begin at verse 9 and read all the way through to 16. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Yeah. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. So typically, Apostle, we hear that one, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. As the writer was writing that, what would you say was the message he was trying to get across to us that would read this? If I don't keep the word before me, if I don't have consciousness of the word, I'm going to sin. Yeah. But I go to church. Doesn't matter. I may not sin those uh, hours, two hours, three hours, but I got a whole week yeah. other than that. So I got to keep the word in, in, in my heart, in my mind. That's why verse 15 said, I will meditate yes. in thy precepts Good point. and have respect unto thy ways. Yes. Meditate. The thing, you know, think about it. For those of us in Christ, we be driving along because we got our natural lives and things that, um, that concern us. But when we have that time to meditate, what are we meditating on? Mm. We're meditating on the word. Mm. We're meditating on God's precept that it'll keep us focused. Every one of us can get out of character. I don't care who you are. That's right. That's You're right. that natural man That's can right. get out of character. Yeah. But it's the word. <laughs> My it's, the word. it's the word of God that does what? Reel us back in. Thank God for the yeah. word. That's what the Paul said. When I would do good. Evil. Mm. Evil was present. It, said, it might be my nature. It might be my desire yeah. to do good. But evil is present. So I have to meditate on the word that I don't snatch somebody's head off. Oh, that's why I love the song. Get the word and stay there. Right? Stay till Jesus comes. Yeah. So, uh, so, Apostle, when you think about it, and I love that point on the meditating piece. Because I can do meditation anyway. Yeah. Right? I can just I can spend time with God. So let me ask you a question. I'm a regular church attendee. Mm -hmm. I, I come to Sabbath school. I'm in the Sabbath service. I'm in Bible study. Mm -hmm. All these things. And that nice. And those things are good. But I still have to outside of the church walls dedicate time to be in God's word. Mm -hmm. I have to be. Somebody said you said it earlier. Been in a committed relationship. Um, when a, a man is married mm -hmm. and he's committed to his wife, he's not committed to her. When they're in the, at, at home, when they're in bed, when they're in the car, when they're at the out to dinner, he's committed to her 24-7. That's right. Whether she's in his presence or not. You know, we are in the presence of the Lord and we, we feel his presence in his sanctuary. That's right. But we are in the presence, and truly in his presence 24-7. So we should always recognize and have that sense that I'm in a committed relationship with the Lord, no matter what, where I go, what I do. And, the, and this is the thing, the one that we're committed to, the eyes of the Lord mm. are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So, you know, uh, you know, I can't slip away. I can't slip out without him knowing it. That's right. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right, so I, we've got one more scripture, and then we're going to open up the questions, and we will wind down. Uh, Isaiah 55. And it's Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. And, and I love Isaiah. Some, some would call Isaiah the eagle eye prophet. He's the prophet in the, the Jesus actually quoted the most. Um, and he's the prophet that when you look at the prophecies that actually uh, talked about Jesus, um, Isaiah has a lot of those prophecies. So when Isaiah actually spoke something, it came to pass. 
And so I would have us think about this as we read Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 8. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but waters the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So we hear a lot about the first few verses there, and then even the verse 11. So Apostle, in this verse right here, so he says, So my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void, but accomplish that which I please. So we say anytime God says something, it's going to come to pass. I'll give you an example. We in Sabbath school. That's right. The words that have been spoken today uh -huh. has gone out, gone out on Facebook Live. They've gone out on the conference call. They've gone out to this audience, this small audience that's in here right now. The word today was sent to somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And to whomever it was sent. Somebody may say me, well if it's you, it's you. Right. But whomever it was sent out to, the word is not gonna let you rest until it accomplished yeah. what it was sent to do. He says, not coming back to me, boy. This hour so that was spent, yeah. not, the, not the you are so great. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. But it's the yeah. word of God he allowed us to speak to a people. Mm -hmm. He says it's going out. Yeah. And it's not going to come back for it. It's going to accomplish what I sent it to do. Mm -hmm. Somebody in California might call and attest to something and say, guess what? I heard it. Mm -hmm. I heard the Sabbath school lesson. And I get calls from a text from California, different places, mm -hmm. people are sharing with us. And I just want to say thank you. Let me give a side eye, a shout out. I thank God for my sister, <laughs> Cookie Walton Garcia, who's in Sacramento, California, who <laughs> shares with us. And it's not, I'm not using her to be the person, but what I'm using as an example. You know, when you do Facebook Live and you do YouTube, it goes out everywhere. Right. It might not accomplish today, but when Sister Rhonda updated, uh, uploaded rather to, to YouTube. It might be somebody watching it then. But whatever purpose yes. God had for this word That's today right. That's right. is not going to return void. It is going to accomplish. Guess what he said? The world is not going to come to an end mm -hmm. until what? That's right. This gospel, this gospel is here. Yeah. And with all this media that we have today, the gospel is going to be here. So part of that gospel being here is accomplishing what the word intended. Amen. Amen. Great, great insight on that, Apostle. Uh, as we wind down, because I know we're at our time, and uh, just wanted to find out, do we have any more questions from our audience before we give our final remarks and turn it into the hands of our superintendent? Yes, this is Brother Bob. I have a question. Yes, sir. As the word of as the word of God preaching at, at, at churches, at church was developed and stuff, I was wondering, do you think it's better for pastors to, to be, um, just like that, if, 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 if a pastor passed on and somebody in the church takes over, or would it be better for the church or, 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 or how the church got to move for somebody else to come from, a, from someone else to preach at that church? You know, there is no, there is no, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off, Brother Devon, go ahead. Because okay, but the thing is, um, would it be better for the um, ministry to still stay inside the church because that person, like the sister pastor who knows what, what, what the church has been toward on, just somebody else coming in and, 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 and teaching the whole different thing? Well, let me, and I know exactly what you're asking. Let me just say this. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. God has to finally say so. You know, if that ministry is at a stalemate and not growing, not, not developing, uh, he may send somebody in from the outside to bring it where it needs to be. Or it may be as you're saying, that he wants uh, what's being taught to continue on 
by somebody within. So there is no right or wrong answer to that. This is the thing. When that happened, that congregation needed to be prayerful that the Lord would send the servant that he has for them. That's a great point. Right, because some, I, I've, I've seen where some churches, they said that God, God sent this person, but then the, the church started failing. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the members start coming and... And next thing they're their churches. And that's... They, they, they go to the off churches and, 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 and shut the doors. That's true. And I, you know, I don't... I, I can't say which way works, which way God intends... But God has a way for every ministry to succeed and grow if the people will subject themselves to it. That's all. Amen. You know, the history here has been since 1920, I think with the exception of one or two persons uh, in, that, in that time, everybody else has been a part of the congregation. Um, I'm, I know Bishop, I mean, uh, Elder Jones, I'm not sure where he came from. I can't get much history on him. Sister Sandy here, I don't know if she have a family or anything about him or not, but she's a historian. But she said no. But um, we had uh, uh, Bishop Henry who came through here and was a very, very real part. But so it, it's hard to say who, what, when, where. Um, but God is in charge. I leave it like that. Amen. Uh, and since we wrap up to the. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. teaches us to train a child the way he should go and he's old he won't depart from it that's a misunderstood um, text so often it didn't say that he's going to obey it didn't say that he's going to stay with it that's right but if you train him in the way he should go he won't depart from that teaching he won't depart from the training he might be the biggest devil out there but the training that he got is in him and he won't depart from it Amen. but you're right yes we, we need to teach him very very early Amen. As we're going to wrap up our Sabbath school lesson, what I would say is let's pray for the leadership of this country. Let's pray for the leadership of our national organization, our leadership of our local church. Amen. Because as we go through this very trying time, we need God to give our leaders wisdom to do the things that they need to do. We thank God for our Apostle Ragland. We thank God for your participation in the Sabbath school. As you go throughout the week, we're going to challenge you. Uh, I challenge you when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is spend time with God. Um, look at the time you spend on your screen. And if you look at the screen time you've got, ask yourself, am I spending this much time with God? And maybe it's just 10 minutes. I, I call it the 10 minute challenge. Just take 10 minutes. You can go on you version of the Bible app or whatever Bible app you've got. They've got great plans. I just encourage you to get into God's word because when I hear God's word, it will change my life. Apostle? Well, somebody has another question. I don't want to. Who is that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I, I've always been confounded with the, with the, with the, with the idea that, um, I know that I know that God is able to do all things, and and when we have a God send somebody to do something uh, down to the events in the Bible, we always equip them to do what He sent them to do. Right. Now I, I, I'm I'm hearing that you have pastors coming in and and they got their own interpretations and they you know, insert their own views.
Well, this is the thing. That's why you have to be proud. We all have to be proudful that God's will will prevail over man's intent. There are people today that from very early on, from teenagers, made it in their mind that that's what they wanted to do. Just like they decided that they want to be a, a doctor, an attorney, or whatever else they decide. Um, people decide they want to preach at an early age. And that doesn't mean that they are called. And that doesn't mean that they are sent. But there is a desire, and they work on that desire. They study, they learn, they they watch preachers, they they mimic preachers. Um, I remember one of the uh, probably 30 years ago or more, and I'm not criticizing this, but many of our young preachers uh, they practice to mimic Bishop Rollins' style. You know, they want to preach like Bishop Rollins, and they and many of them did. But my point is. Let God call you, let God prepare you, and however he chooses for you to deliver, that's what you would do. Yeah. But that's all, somebody in the back, I didn't cut anybody off, it's hard to do um, um, when, when we're not seeing your face and your hands uh, in the sanctuary. Did we miss anybody? Apparently not, I'm going to get you back to Sister Charmaine to have her final words before I do the closing. Amen. We do thank the Lord for blessing us. Uh -huh. Testing. We do thank the Lord for blessing us in the Sabbath school this morning. And I trust the Lord. And through faith, I believe that God, the, the word that was sent out today, has pricked somebody's heart. Somebody I know. I feel encouraged, and I hope that you do too. And I want to encourage you, however that the Lord has touched your heart today, uh, receive, try him, question him, ask him that he will come and reveal himself unto you, that the Lord, that you will feel strengthened in God, because we thank the Lord for how, even through this difficult time, that God is drawing us closer. I don't know about you, but I feel the draw. Amen. Amen. I'm feeling like he's drawing me closer into mm -hmm. him. And I was one of those that when I would read God's word, I would get frustrated because I didn't understand. But I encourage you, stay with it. Stay with Go back and right. read again. Go back and read again. Because God is going to send somebody, whether it's through the man of God, he's going to send somebody that will give you clarity. And the next thing you know, He's going to connect the dots for you in his word. So be encouraged. We thank God for the Sabbath school today. Stay tuned. Thank God if the Lord be willing, we'll be doing this again next Sabbath. We'll turn it over into the hands of our pastor, Apostle James Ragland. Amen. Thank you, Sister, uh, Sister White. Let me just say this before we close. As many of you uh, in Virginia know that the state of Virginia has opened um, uh, what's called phase one which allow churches to have 50% of their capacity. Um, the reason why we have not elected to do that yet is we do not have the proper PPE. We have things on order. And we didn't just order this stuff this week. It's been on order, been on back order. So it is, uh, Deacon Preston was saying, you know, pray for the country, the president, the, the leadership. That's why I'm saying pray for us also. We have a committee that we put together to get not just a one-man show, but everybody in this committee have different people from different backgrounds that have that input, and we are taking all of this to come up with a best-case scenario. When we come back to the sanctuary, we don't want our people to be jeopardized. That's right. You don't been out all this time and, and was able to survive. Um, I don't want you to come back and be uh, infected at the church. That's right. So we want to make, or if you were infected somewhere else, that you come to the church and infect somebody else. So we we are quite um, knowledgeable of what's taking place and what other people might be doing. But when we come back in, um, it's going to be a gradual thing. How we're going to open? We'll give you more insight um, as we get the equipment we need. It is my desire that all of us can get back here, but we're not going to get back and, and uh, be a, to the detriment of somebody else. 
Other churches around may do this, that, or the other. We pray for them. We encourage them to uh, look at their congregations and make the decision. And our decisions here are not predicated by what somebody else is doing. We have to make the best decision for the members here. So as soon as we can, and we will gradually begin to do more. Uh, I wish this afternoon that the church was full, but I know that's not practical, nor is it wise. So stay with us. We're, we're not being slowful. We're really trying to get this done um, in a, ma in a ma manner that's going to be good for the saints. With that being said, we're going to um, dismiss you now. And at 1 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time, we'll be back for our afternoon worship. Thank you for calling in. Thank you for viewing us on Facebook Live. If you're able to come back with us at 1 o'clock for our praise and worship and the word on today, please do so. We're looking forward to you being with us. And again, thank you for tuning in. And we'll say so long for now. God bless you. God bless.